Okay, we're going to start uh, portfolio theory. So this, you know, these are going to be a, a series of lectures um, uh, going through Markowitz, the CAPM, the, the APT. So as the first of these lectures, uh, we're going to start by by stepping back and and really looking at um, how we how we describe assets. So in other words, when we're going to go into Markowitz and the CAPM. Um, how do we view assets? We're going to construct portfolios and, and uh, what aspects of the underlying assets, assets uh, being stocks, bonds, uh, uh, and so forth, what aspects of these assets are going to go into um, uh, deciding you know, how much of that asset goes into our portfolio? So um, the first thing to, to now, this is skipping ahead a little bit. We're going to talk about Markowitz and CAPM in the future. However, uh, what we should take note of at this point is that um, the CAPM assumes Markowitz. So everything in the, the you know, the assumptions of the CAPM are the assumptions of, of Markowitz with some additional assumptions. Um, so in, in Markowitz, all investors are mean variance optimizers. So what that means is uh, investors, oh, and this is all investors, all investors only care about uh, the, the mean and the variance, the first two moments of the probability density function. So the first thing to consider is, when we look at an asset, we describe that asset by its probability density function. That's how, and, um, and its joint probability density function, how, how, it's, it, how it relates to other assets, and that's going to be particularly important. So this is how we describe it. So when we say that they're mean variance optimizers, we're saying investors only care about the first two moments of that um, probability density function. So uh, in other words, they care about uh, the mean, the variance, they don't care about higher moments uh, that we're going to talk briefly about, skewness and kurtosis and so forth. So in other words, this is consistent with um, investors having something like quadratic utility. So in other, and we're going to talk about this in, in later lectures. But for example, investors may have a utility function uh, that looks like something uh, minus um, one one half a sigma squared. So in other words, uh, you know, they, they like uh, return uh, and they penalize, you know, whatever the, you know, they, the utility penalizes the uh, high variance, right? So um, Markowitz assumes something like this, that the investors are mean variance optimizers, which is consistent with the utility function like this. So uh, if we are going to look for probability density functions to, to describe assets, um, the probability density function can only take two inputs. So uh, a very um, nice probability density function, which is uh, completely defined by its first two moments, the mean and variance, is the normal distribution. So uh, in other words, um, very often we just assume uh, that assets, you know, so, you know, for wh whatever our asset, you know, asset uh, one, x1 is distributed normally with some mean and some variance. Now, Markowitz and CAPM don't strictly require a normal density. Um, uh, however, you know, if, particularly for this course at the undergraduate level, we can assume, just assume that they're, they're, they're a normal density. In reality, you know, they can be any uh, distribution of a class of elliptical distributions. But however, um, for now, quadratic utility mean variance uh, is going to say that the, uh, imply that we're going to use the normal uh, distribution. Uh, and I'm going to go in and talk about why, the, you know, at least in my opinion, that's not, that's not the worst assumption. Um, so, now, uh, once we assume this again, um, uh, this says a lot. Now, there's, a, there's some reasons why we like the normal distribution. So, um, why we may use the normal distribution. Uh, the normal distribution, one, in portfolio theory, we're going to be concerned with risk. And the nice thing about the, the, the normal distribution is it's symmetric, so we can use measures like the standard deviation of returns as risk. Uh, the idea here is um, because you know, when we talk about risk, we, we're talking about the probability of loss. And if the normal distribution is nice and symmetric like that, then deviations below the mean, right, deviations here below the mean, look the same as deviations above the mean. So I can use the standard deviation, and I think I'll probably talk a little bit more about this in future lectures, uh, but when you when you take the standard deviation, um, you you know in a sample standard deviation, you're you're taking you know the, the return at time. Maybe I should use R for return. You're taking the return at time t minus you know, and you're squaring. So this is what's going into the variance in the standard deviation calculation. So it's the um, this you know the variance is the average square deviation from the mean, and the standard deviation is the positive square root of that. So in other words, we lose. 
um, which of these returns are positive deviations from the mean and which of these returns are negative deviations from the mean. And that's fine, um, so long as the positive deviations look exactly like the, or the, the negative deviations look exactly like the positive deviations. However, if, you know, if the distribution is instead skewed like that, then the positive deviations don't look anything like the negative deviations and standard deviation makes less sense as a measure of risk. So one thing is it naturally follows to use standard deviation as a measure of risk once we make the assumption uh, of a normal distribution. More importantly, however, particularly for portfolio theory, uh, if you take some number, some random variable x is distributed normally, uh, then um, uh, also if we just multiply x by some constant, x1 is also distributed normally. Uh, and let me, let me call the constants. I might, I might call the constants, some texts will call them omega. Uh, I'm just going to call them w for weights. Um, but if, if w is some constant, then w type x1 is also normally distributed. And importantly, uh, I'll just put that as weight 1. Um, if uh, w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2. Uh, this is also normally distributed. So the idea, and this is going to be important when we construct portfolios, if I have two normally distributed assets um, and I multiply each by a constant, like a weight, I put you know, 60% of my portfolio on this asset, 40% of my portfolio on this asset, then my portfolio is also normally distributed. So the nice thing about the normal distribution, the really nice thing when we're constructing portfolios, is that, um, that uh, the portfolios we then construct will be normally distributed. So we stay in the same distribution. Um, so that's a really nice you know, aspect of the normal distribution. Of course, you know, there are other reasons why we use the normal distribution in other areas of finance, investments, when we assume geometric Brownian motion and so forth. Um, but, but for portfolio theory, this is, you know, I want to make these two points that um, standard deviation as a measure of risk and, um, and how the portfolio will then be normally distributed, how, why that's, that's um, why it's particularly nice to use a normal distribution in this case. So, the first question here is, how bad is that assumption? Um, all assumptions are a little bit bad, but you know, is this a really bad assumption to use a normal distribution? Uh, like I said, what, what we are doing when we assume this is we assume all, um, all other higher moments are the same, right? So what we're assuming is skewness is zero, um, and for every asset, and the kurtosis is three for every asset. So what that means is um, the third moment, now keep in mind, um, uh, when we go to the second moment, we're squaring the deviations from the mean, so we lose the sign. When we go to the third moment, um, a negative number to the third power is, is a negative number, so skewness uh, treats positive and negative deviations from the mean separately. So in, in the calculation of skewness, you have this raised to the third power. So um, what we have here is, you know, this, uh, this might be a negatively skewed distribution, right? Uh, and this would, be, um, this would be a positively skewed distribution like that. So in other words, what we're saying is we don't have distributions like this uh, when we make that normal assumption. Now, we in fact absolutely you know, do find distributions like this in, in, you know, when we look at you know, how stocks and how bonds behave. Um, there's also been research that has shown, of course, you, know, you might like this, you might like the positive skewness. And we've, there's been research um, that shows uh, certain uh, classes of investors will search out, actively search out positively skewed assets. Um, of course, we don't like these negatively skewed assets. We don't like um, this long tail there. And then again, um, the problem with that long tail is if you're using a measure like the standard deviation, you're averaging over these positive deviations and these negative deviations, where in this case, you really only want to um, average over these negative deviations, right? So I, I want to get rid of these in my risk calculation. I want to average over these deviations. And this is why we get some measures of downside risk. So we have, you know, if we were, if, if we were going to say, okay, there is skewness, then we have to use some downside risk measures, measures that only look at that tail of the distribution. Uh, so uh, now um, what we also assume is there's no uh, excess kurtosis. So, and, and I'm going to stop and, and make a quick note here. Um, kurtosis is going to be the fourth moment of the distribution. The kurtosis of the normal distribution is three. So a lot of people will use kurtosis interchangeably with excess kurtosis, and a lot of software will. So if you calculate, use some software to calculate kurtosis, make, look at that uh, calculation. So if you do an R and Excel and so forth, look at that calculation to see if it returns excess kurtosis or just kurtosis. So the, the kurtosis of the normal distribution is, is three. Uh, and what the kurtosis measures 
um, you've probably heard the term, it, 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 um, it measures the tendency for there to be outliers. Right? Kurtosis is going to be the fourth moment. So we have the deviation from the mean to the fourth power, which means we lose um, uh, negative deviations are again positive, positive deviations are again positive. So in other words, we lose the sign of the devi deviation. So it's going to measure the, the propensity for outliers, or, or, or often said it's, it's uh, the fatness of the tails. So, uh, um, and, and what we do find is, is yes, you know, uh, stocks generally do have fat tails. Um, so what we, when we make this assumption, we're assuming no skewness and then no excess kurtosis. The tails aren't, the tails aren't fat. Uh, so the, now uh, I've under this video um, in the comment or you know in the description I put a link to an interactive web application where you can um, input a stock and you can see uh, uh, the normal distribution you know it, the, the 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 app will calculate the mean and variance and plot the normal distribution and plot an empirical distribution the empirical distribution is like a histogram it's just what actually happened over one period of history um, and often you're going to see that. Uh, and then it'll do a t-test. It, well, it'll do tests for, for um, uh, uh, skewness and kurtosis. So, uh, and what you're going to often find is, yes, you know, uh, we find skewness, yes, we find kurtosis. Um, you know, so, so, so there is, they are skewed. Now, uh, so you can take a look at that. Now, the question is, how bad of assumption is this? Well, getting back to what we're going to use this for, uh, uh, we're going to use this and plug it into Marklitz and the cap app. Um, so we have to describe, so we're going to say this is the mean and this is the, and, and generally when, when we're using Markowitz, we're going to calculate the, the, the variance by all the covariances of the asset with all the other assets. We're going to plug in, this is the mean and this is the covariance um, between this asset and all other assets. Uh, and we could use, um, uh, there's two things we have to do here. Now, Markowitz assumes we know the mean and the covariance. So, one of the biggest assumptions beyond the distributional assumption that we're going to have to make um, is something like uh, um, the, the, the history, the future is like history. Uh, this is, you know, uh, this is not this is not a good assumption. Really, you shouldn't make it. But um, the idea is we need to plug some parameters. So let's say we know that this is a drawback to the normal distribution, but we're going to use a normal distribution. So if we're going to use a normal distribution of Markowitz, we're going to have to plug in mean and covariance parameters. Uh, and how do we get those? So what, I, what I'm trying to get at is a far worse assumption than normal distribution is whatever assumption we have to make to get those parameters. So in other words, um, you know, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to forecast the parameters. Uh, and um, the, the obvious drawback there is, is uh, you know, we're really bad at forecasting the future. So any forecast in the future is probably going to be you know, not accurate. Um, and uh, well, we, we could also use history. Of course, there, then there's a big assumption that, that the future is like the, you know, is like the past, and, and that, is, that is a bad assumption. There's also a, a really bad assumption about using historical parameters. So I can estimate the mean, and I can estimate the historical covariances. But the problem is, Markowitz is going to be really sensitive to those parameters. So, and then there's a, there's a distribution around those. So there's a mean with some probability that the mean is in this interval. And, and similarly with, with the variance. So, in other words, you can move the mean around in that, that you know, a reasonable confidence interval and move that covariance in a reasonable conf confidence interval. And you'll see the outputs of Markowitz change dramatically. So, what I'd say, and at least this is a little bit of my opinion, is I wouldn't get too bogged down. You can, uh, you can look at that app and see how bad the normal distribution is. One case I'd make is if you averaged over a lot of different time periods where you looked at the sort of empirical distribution of what has actually happened, you know, it begins to look more normal. Whereas if you look over one snapshot of a period, then it can look very abnormal. Um, also, the, you know, the smaller the stock and it can have um, more non-normal distribution. But if you're looking at a big stock and a portfolio and, and you look at it over a long period of time, generally the normal distribution, distribution isn't bad. Um, so at least I would get hung up with that. What I would get more hung up with is the fact that if we assume the normal, we're going to have to input parameters into that. And what parameters do we use? And I'd say that that's probably, you know, in 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 practice, that's that's a that's a bigger hurdle um, than than simply the normal distribution. Uh, good. So I, I I think I hit the points that I want to make, and any point that I missed, I uh, will uh, follow up with in, in additional videos.
um, definitely take a look at the the, the online app. Uh, there's gonna it's a chapter online, and, and you know it's got a couple online applications, um, interactive applications. Uh, we'll talk next. You know, after we've covered this, we'll 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 dive into a brief video on value at risk, um, and then we will jump into uh, how to construct markets, um, uh, and, and ultimately the campaign. Good.